from the University of Cologne. And he is going to be talking about uh, Julia for physics. Thanks very much. Uh, no, no applause yet. I haven't spoken yet. So, <laughs> so uh, hello, everyone. Welcome to my lightning talk. My name is Carsten Bauer. I'm a PhD student in physics at the University of Cologne in the group of Simon Drebst. And uh, I would like to take the next 10-ish minutes and speak about running quantum Monte Carlo simulations in Julia. So let me start by giving you an impression of what I actually do, although not all of you might be physicists. So in my PhD, I study quantum critical metals. Typically, these are metallic compounds cooked up in a lab, which at very low temperatures show a phase transition from a magnetically ordered metallic phase to a disordered magnetic phase, a non-magnetic phase. And as these transitions happen at very low temperatures, in fact, very close to absolute zero, uh, thermal fluctuations are frozen out and it's solely quantum fluctuations that drive this phase transition. And this gives rise to, a, to this kind of fan-shaped quantum critical region in the phase diagram, in which interesting physics happens that is uh, still part of very active research, part of my PhD. And I kind of asked the question, how do the metallic properties of that system um, depend on where I am in this phase diagram? And in particular, what's the nature of the metallic state in this quantum critical regime? And as it turns out, quite often also new phases in relation to this quantum critical effect, new phases appear, such as high temperature superconductivity, which is a phase where the electrons conduct electricity with vanishing resistance. And to answer these kind of questions, I apply quantum Monte Carlo. So for those of you who are not in the quantum, quantum business, quantum Monte Carlo is just conventional Markov chain Monte Carlo <laughs> for a quantum problem. So we rewrite your quantum problem in a way that it becomes amendable to classical Monte Carlo, in it, if you will. And so what I do is these are the magnetic moments of my system, magnetic degrees of freedom. Um, Starting from this configuration, I perform local and global moves, which means taking one of those arrows and rotating them uh, to generate a Markov chain. And whether I accept such a move or not is determined by the metropolis uh, probability. And what makes this a special problem and a difficult and also computationally expensive problem is that apart from this factor, which is kind of the energy difference that just comes from these configurations themselves, is the, the feedback to the electrons, which shows up in the second, second part here. So here we have determinants of complex valued uh, matrices. So what the metallic structure really does of the problem is it adds some linear algebra to the problem. So, my, uh, so the Monte Carlo problem now has a linear algebra component. And it's not just calculating the determinant what makes this computationally uh, expensive, but in fact it turns out that calculating the matrix G itself is numerically unstable and you have to, you know, apply all, all kinds of stabilization tricks uh, to make this work. So as I said, metallic nature renders the problem difficult and expensive. And to give you a feeling for what I mean by expensive uh, is that I have to run, my codes run for millions of CPU hours on modern uh, supercomputers. So I, and it's just me that does it. So there's no huge team behind it or something. It's one person that burns out all of this uh, computational effort. And so certainly you want to have a nice language uh, and also a performant language for performing these simulations. And in my eyes, Julia is the best language for uh, writing these uh, simulations. And I want to boil this down to three reasons why and I want to explain them uh, step by step. So first of all, when I started with my PhD, um, I, I started, in fact, writing in C++, and what really kept me from being productive in, in that early stage where I still learned the problem, learned the method, was, to, uh, was, to, uh, was the fact that C++ kind of imposed all kinds of technical issues on top of the physics that I didn't understand. And so Julia is very different in that sense, that it speaks linear algebra fluently. I can just, you know, even in, in this very early uh, a state of mind is early, uh, my, my very premature understanding of the problem, write down an algorithm that might be wrong, but at least it, it works and I can continuously kind of improve on the, on the algorithm. And then once you have your code running, it, it works, it produces the right numbers, you want to make it efficient. 
And the nice thing about Julia is that you systematically can optimize it. There's a clear set of rules then you can, that you can learn and follow by. In fact, the, the first speaker today, he said something like, uh, with my understanding of Julia, the, the speed like went down. And that's exactly what happened to me as well. So by learning these rules, and in particular, I wrote more dots here. This refers to the more dots blog post by Stephen G. Johnson. When I read this blog post, I applied it. It took me like two hours, and uh, my code was like, almost twice as fast. So um, I, I, I don't have the time to go through all these systematic optimizations, but let me show you a quick benchmark. So when I started, as in many cases, there was a C++ code available in our group, and I also started coding in C++, as I said. And then I fortunately, I, I learned, I met Julia, if you will, and uh, the first naive code I wrote down, this was really without any, any deep knowledge about Julia, any performance optimization, was uh, in the interesting limit of large system sizes was about a, a factor of two slower. So this is not too bad in fact, because uh, Python, we also have a kind of a Python implementation, it's about a factor of four slower. Not optimized Python, I don't wanna you know, get into the comparison business here, but this is a physicist's benchmark. It's just my problem running these codes and, and see how, how codes are performing. And after applying these, I called it more dots again, so it's a bit more than just more dots, but you know, doing in-place optimizations and everything, I could get it down to just be on par with C++ and even be slightly faster. Um, the slight, getting it slightly faster was basically linking it to MKL. As I said, the, the nature uh, that is complicated here is uh, linear algebra, so it really matters which, which core uh, package you use here. The C++ code was also using MKL. And so coming back to my list, what I believe is that in the end, you, you formulate your problem, you systematically optimize it, and what you in the end get is very flexible production code. It's a playground for new ideas, so we played around with neural networks and all kinds of fancy things, and this, I think, wouldn't have been that easily possible in a, like lower language, um, maybe C++, but certainly not Fortran, I would guess. And one thing I wanna mention here is, uh, that is, I think, also quite typically in, in sciences, is that in some part of the phase diagram I showed you, for some set of input parameters, your problem might actually be easier. For example, this matrix G I, uh, I showed you, it might, might be real, or it might have a symmetry, it might be smaller. And Julia, by setting dynamic types, you know, uh, using parametric types on the multiple dispatch system, uh, is a really neat way of, at runtime, filtering out the right methods to run for this particular problem. It's something that I, I was really amazed by. It's much better, in principle, you can uh, achieve the same thing by using many if-else statements everywhere in your code, but this is not just like much better readable, it's also uh, cooler from a computer science perspective, and I think also uh, faster because you can kind of apply all kinds of optimizations here. So yeah, so, and this brings me to my uh, last slide in the, Okay, I seem to be good on time, so maybe I have another slide. But <laughs> this, is, this is my of official uh, last slide. So I started writing a package, Monte Carlo JL, earlier this year. It's for running simulations like I do. It's a premature package. It's not registered yet, so you have to go to my GitHub to find it. I believe that this is enough information for this audience to find it. And um, what I want to do at this point, so what does it do? It's, it's supposed to be a collection of Monte Carlo flavors that have a well-defined interface such that uh, users can download the package, customize a model, and use these flavors. Because what happens is that every physicist rewrites the same Monte Carlo scheme. Of course, there are some, some specifics to the problem, but the core should stay the same. And this is a, the very premature try to kick this off. So at, at this early stage, I really want just to get in touch with you, so maybe later today, if you, if you also work on Monte Carlo, approach me and maybe we can uh, work on this together. So far, it's just me. Uh, but have a look, download it, it should work. It comes with the attractive Hubbard model, so a fermionic problem, it comes with the easing model. So it, it's working, but uh, don't use it for, for production. I, I haven't thoroughly tested it. Okay, so I, I think I have time for one more slide. So let me thank you in a second. Uh, I also wanted to mention why Julia is not perfect. I was kind of sad that I had to kick this out when I was preparing the talk. So uh, it's, it's, it's not you know, the most general 
problems that I see in the Julia language, but it's just for this particular problem running these simulations. And most importantly, running it on a cluster. So package loading times is, is really, you know, I use it also for scripting on a cluster. And there it's basically, for me at least, impossible to keep an interactive session running for a long time. I have to kind of, uh, I get, I have to submit a job, I have to wait for the permission. So I have to script in a way. So this really affects my, my life. Uh, the second thing is updating package might break running job. So for me running these, you know, thousands of jobs at the same time, basically over a year, there's no single point in time where I have no job running. I mean, it's really rarely after the server crashed or, or something like that. And so the problem is, I, at some point I, I evolve my code and maybe my code now depends on a newer version of a package. I wanna update to, uh, to, to for the new runs that I start to use this more, more uh, the newer version of my code. And the problem is this updating by pre-compiling old packages might just crash all my running jobs. So it's, it's kind of a complexity that I didn't expect when I started to work with Julia, uh, which is quite annoying. Um, and the third thing is, for physicists at least, matplotlib, which is accessible through pyplot in Julia, is kind of the standard for plotting. And one can discuss why and all. I don't wanna get into this, but right now I'm using it as well. And if you compile Julia yourself and link it against MKL, uh, you will see that pyplot won't work anymore. It's, it's because of a 64-bit interface reason, uh, interface reason in, in, in NumPy that's incompatible with the MKL. So Stephen G. Johnson tried, tried to get this working and as far as I know, at, at least uh, up to last week, he wasn't able to, uh, to tell me how to do it. Um, so these are my personal three things that I would like to see improved in, in a future version of Julia. And with this, I go back to the final slide. So thank you for your attention and very much for developing Julia and making it the great language it is. Thank you, Karsten. Questions? Hi, going back to your last slide, um, I'd like to talk about points one and two. The, the last slide, you mean the, yeah, the which the I don't like? The things you did, the problem, Julia. Um, yeah, sure. Package loading times, uh, obviously you went to the package three talk where they demonstrated package loading times, which were, uh, uh, installation times, which were much faster. But you said something about you weren't able to have an interactive session in the cluster. Could you tell us more about that? Sorry. I, I can uh, comment on both of these things. So first yeah. of all, by package loading, I mean using something and pressing enter. I don't mean installing packages. Right. Um, so that's what I meant by that. But yeah, the, the, the problem on the cluster is, you know, there's typically, at least the setups I work in, there's a lock-in node. You're not actually supposed to calculate on these lock-in nodes. They are just for, I don't know, moving files around and maybe even, sometimes even not even compiling things. So uh, I, I shouldn't be running my Julia interact uh, interactive session there. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes I'm, I'm fortunate and there is an interactive node somewhere, but I kind of have to request a certain amount of time and so I don't know in advance maybe how long it will take to, to simulate this problem. So logging on to this node and opening their interactive session is a risky business because after a while the system might just shut me down uh, at some point. So this is what I mean that on my, on my desktop computer I don't have that issue at all. I can just keep an interactive session running for, for days. I mean, I, you know, that's, that's kind of what I meant. I, I build HPC systems for a living. Oh, so I see, yeah. I've that really is to related to you, the people who are managing your clusters, how long you, you're allowed to, to have an, an interactive session. I, 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 however, from a, someone who manages HPC clusters, we often see people who open interactive sessions and don't do anything, and that is very frustrating from our point of view. This guy's sitting there, he's, he's chewing up resources, and he's not, he's not actually running any computations, and we can, we can see that. So. Yeah, I, I agree that's a problem. Maybe, maybe one more thing yeah. to comment on that. Apart from the interactive session part, mm -hmm. I also use Julia for scripting. So for, you know, ge generating job files and everything. And this I wouldn't do on such an interactive computing yeah, node. Sure. I would do it on a lock-in node. But, and there I would run a script and there package loading times also yeah. matter. But, but your second point about updating packages, uh, breaking running jobs, I mean, yes. I, um, I agree that's a concern. The very quick answer to that is, of course, you should use, be using containers where the, the thing is fixed. Uh, if we don't, we'll put that to one side. I mean, that's the glib answer these days. That, oh, you use containers, it will solve all these problems. I mean, I think one of the problems is you're probably reading everything from your own home directory. 
and you are updating the, the packages, and as you say, as the job's running. I mean, the, again, that should be the people who are administering your cluster should be providing Julia for you. Um, it, it, it's just another level of complexity. In a yeah. way, I could also do what, what uh, uh, Stefan suggested earlier today. Yeah. You know, in every instance of my code, reset the Julia package here. I could, for every uh, job, I could have my own package here. No, I, 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 I don't, I'm, I'm agreeing with you. I think number two is a problem. Um, I, can, I, can see why, I can see why that, that, that is a problem. Um, you, and uh, I, I've seen terrible things with Python happening where people have their own Python Anaconda installations in their home directories and insist on using that. And, and Python, to be honest, is in a real mess in scientific computing because of the, the complexity of packages. Um, you know, people insist on having their own particular mix of, mix of packages and the systems guys are sort of running to keep up with it. And I really hope that doesn't happen with Julia. I really hope Julia can get, can get this sorted out. Um, Great. Um, I'm sure there are other questions for Carsten, and I'd encourage you guys to hunt him down at lunchtime and continue this chat. Uh, but let's move on. Thank you, Carsten. Sure.